Once you've ruled out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Devon. It is vampirism, and there's a host of damned souls of Pelham House. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night. Here, the old gods are dead. And what of the true god? He's dead. He can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio. I'm your host, Irene Allen Block, and with me tonight is my co-host, Mark Johnson. Hello. Hello, Mark. And Andrew Chaplin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's Andrew. <laughs> I think you've got a sore throat or something, Andrew. A sore throat? <laughs> well, you've gone rather deep. Oh, this is my natural talking voice. Okay, all right. Then we'll save it for till later, eh? Well, I just wanted to say we we are um, coming up and Christmas is is just right around the corner. So we are having our special Christmas theme show. And before we get into our guest, uh, you know what? This is going to perfectly fit in with tonight's show. I think, uh, Andrew, you have a Christmas ghost story to tell us. I do, and it happened actually today, funnily enough, very strangely. Um, I went into St Albans with a very psychic friend of mine called Indigo, um, and she's on on Facebook as Indigo Phoenix. She's highly psychic, and she's into kind of uh, witchy stuff as well. We were in St Albans, going to the little Christmas market, and we were in the old part of St Albans, walking around in the little gift shops. So we're going to this one particular gift shop, walking around, collecting a few bits for Christmas, and... We uh, went past like a candle section and then we went to pay our um, for our goods at the tills. Whilst we were standing there, there were three, two or three red candles, big red candles just flew off the shelf. Absolutely bizarre. No one was near them. No one was touching them. Um, and they didn't just roll and drop, you know, as if kind of there's been a vibration and they just kind of plopped down. They flew off um, in the same kind of style as I don't know if, if people have seen kind of like CCTV footage of um, haunted shops where things have literally flown off the shelves. It was just like that. They landed on the floor and some of the staff quickly, hurriedly grabbed the candles, put them back on the shelf as if nothing had happened. And I asked them, is this shop haunted by any chance? And they looked at me completely unfazed as if it's the most natural thing in the world and said, oh, yeah, all the shops are haunted in this um, place. And they, and the, the way they said it was as if it was kind of like, yeah, this happens all the time. Not a problem. So you, so you <laughs> actually cool. witnessed this, Andrew? You actually saw yep, them yep, fly? Right. Yeah, it was right next to us. We all looked at each other. I looked at Indigo. Indigo looked at me. We looked at the staff. The staff looked at us, and there was no one there. And the, and literally, that's exactly what happened. They flew off the shelf, and it wasn't even kind of like nighttime, kind of like you know three o'clock in the morning on a, you know CCTV. This was in a busy shop, although no one was actually by the candles. Really, really bizarre. Never so, experienced. So that. they've obviously got poltergeist stuff. Too, yeah, absolutely. It? And their reaction completely unfazed, as if it's the most natural thing, as if it happens every day kind of thing. Well, to really some of us, it does. <laughs> yeah, or to you, certainly. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought I'd share that one. Really, really interesting, actually. Okay, let's get on with the show then. Our guest today is Simon Entwistle. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello there. Nice to be with you. Hello, Simon. Simon's from Top Hat Tours, aren't you, Simon? So you're yes, going to tell us you? a lot of nice stories tonight. Thanks, Aaron. I run my own um, tourism business called Top Hat Tours, but I tend to cover a wide variety of guided ghost, murder and mystery tours. Wow. And I find um, the best way to conduct a tour is not to read about ghost stories, but to actually meet people. 
who've actually come across ghosts themselves. And that makes the, the stories a lot more interesting, but also um, a, a lot more authentic, if you will, really. And um, we are coming towards Christmas, and I've got uh, one or two Christmas ghost stories for you. Um, one or two of them last about, say, four minutes. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, we got two hours uh, to go here, so take your time. Well, we, really we're gonna, good. we're gonna have, really good, we're gonna encourage people to get get your spiked eggnogs, get put your feet up by the fire, you know, make sure your Christmas tree is all lit up, because we are going to be hearing some Christmas ghost stories. So um, don't forget the mulled wine. Don't forget Sorry? the mulled wine is essential. Oh, mulled wine, yeah, definitely mulled, mulled wine. Okay, then. So if everybody's got their eggnog or mulled wine and their box of chocolates and everything else, let's get on with the show. Simon, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Arian. Okay. Uh, some years ago, I met a, a marvellous gentleman called Mr Billy Lakin. And in response to ads in my local newspaper, he came to my house uh, to tell me a ghost story. Um, he sat in my front room and he reached into his pocket and produced a photograph of himself and 57 young lads all outside St Mary's Parish Church office in Clitheroe. On the back of the photograph was everyone's name and the words Clitheroe Territorial Army. Bill explained when the photograph was taken they were all sent across the um, English Channel to a place called the Maginot Line in France. The Maginot Line were indeed French defences. They were told they'll be impregnable. For 10 months, Bill walked up and down the Maginot Line, waving at the Germans, and the Germans waved back. It was almost as if no one actually wanted to start the war. This all changed on the 10th of May, 1940, when the Germans launched what's called Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. And Bill found himself in a rather embarrassing situation with the rest of the British Army. <clears throat> the Germans, instead of attacking the Maginot Line, came round the back of it, and Bill and his pals rushed at great speed with half the German army on their heels to the channel port of Dunkirk. When he got to Dunkirk, he was absolutely shattered. No food, no water, plenty of seawater to drink, but no fresh water. And for four days, the British army huddled on the beach of Dunkirk, waiting to be evacuated by a small flotilla of ships codenamed Operation Dynamo. On the fourth day, his officer said, right boys, it's our turn to be evacuated. We're gonna make our way down to the water's edge and the Royal Navy will get us back to England. As he made his way down towards the water's edge, a German aircraft came down the beach and opened fire. Bill dived under the water. When he came to the surface, the water was crimson red with the blood of his mates. He was pulled on board a small vessel, then ferried out to a Royal Naval warship, where he was given the best meal he's ever had, a mug of tea, a woodbine cigarette, and indeed, a corned beef sandwich. He got back to England and um, his uniform was in shreds. He made his way back to St Mary's Parish Church office where that photograph was taken. It was the old TA centre, the Territorial Army Centre. And as he went into the building, out of those 57 young men that had gone with him to France, only 19 had got back. They were told there and then to make up the numbers. Now in those days, if you were 18 years old, you were conscripted. If you were 17 years old, you could join her, His Majesty's Armed Forces, but you had to have your mother and father's consent. Bill was 19, he had a young friend who was 17, and this young boy said, Oh, Bill, go and see me mum and dad. Get and sign this consent form. I want to fight for my country. Bill saw this young boy's parents, and they said, Sorry, he's only 17. The war could be over next year anyway. Oh, please, mum, please, dad, sign the consent form. I want to fight for my country. They gave in on one condition. That condition being that Billy would look after him like a brother. And he swore he would do. He told both parents, don't worry, I will look after him. The newly formed Clither platoon were then sent overseas to the beautiful Greek island of Crete to make up the garrison there, along with the Australian and New Zealand armed forces. On the 21st of May, 1941, the Germans launched a highly disciplined airborne invasion of Crete by using glider-borne infantry and paratroopers. The British, Australian, New Zealand boys put up a good fight. They didn't have enough ammunition, they had no air cover, and the Germans took the island. And sadly, in the fighting, nine of Bill's mates were killed in action, one of them being the 17-year-old young boy. Bill was absolutely devastated at the death of this young lad and blamed himself entirely. 
From his prisoner war camp through the Red Cross, he wrote letters back to this young boy's parents, just simply begging their forgiveness. Letters came back through the Red Cross to his POW camp in Poland with the words, Bill, we do not hold you responsible for the death of our son. Please do not feel responsible for the death of our son. But Bill did. When he got back to England in 1945, this young boy's death haunted him and haunted him until the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, 1968, when he made his way to St Mary's Parish Church Office, the old Territorial Army Centre, to watch the Clitheroe Operatic Society's Christmas play. He was the very last person to leave the building. He stood outside and lit a cigarette. As he smoked the cigarette, his mind went back to his wartime experiences and that photograph taken in 1939. He took a deep sigh and he extinguished the cigarette with his foot. He then made his way past the building by himself when he heard three whispers. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, Billy. He turned round and saw the ghost of the young boy in British Army uniform. The first thing Bill noted was this young boy hadn't aged a day. He looked exactly as he had on Crete in 1941. The boy put up his ghostly arm and whispered the words, Hey, Bill, I'm okay. Don't worry about me, Bill. I'm okay. I've always been all right. Don't worry about me. With this, Bill's knees gave away. He knelt on the cobblestones in the little alleyway next to the St Mary's Parish Church Centre. And in his own words, he bellowed like a wounded animal. The tears streamed down his cheeks. He almost yelped in pain. As he looked up, the boy turned, smiled and vaporised. Billy got to his feet in a state of trauma. He walked through the town of Clitheroe that night, past the happy Christmas revellers, but the last thing he felt was celebrating anything. He got home, he climbed into bed and fell into the deepest sleep he'd had in many years. The following day, Christmas Day, 1968, he was woken by the nearby church bells of St Mary's Church. He got out of bed and felt a lot more happy in himself. He then made his way to the washroom. He caught his reflection in the shaving mirror and looked again and again and again and saw a change in his facial appearance. He noted for the first time inside since 1941, he was actually smiling and he felt he'd been truly forgiven for the death of this young boy all those years ago on the island of Crete in 1941. I will never forget Bill's words as he left my house that day. He said, Simon, I did not believe in ghosts until I saw one with my own eyes. And they are Billy's words. A very, very touching and a very moving story. Wow. <laughs> it is. Brilliant. It Brilliant. It certainly is. Any more? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot more. <laughs> I love all this. You know, let me let me ask you with these stories uh, before we get into the next one. Let me just ask, you know, what kind of research do you put in to find out about these stories of these locations? Okay, the best thing I find with all of my tours is not to read about ghost stories, but to talk to people who have actually seen ghosts, and that's that's what makes the stories even better to hear it from the horse's mouth, if you will a phrase we use here in the United Kingdom, um, you actually hear it from the eyewitnesses. And you can always tell when someone, uh, again to use an English term, when somebody is pulling your leg, when somebody is actually making fun of you. But you can always tell when someone is being very, very serious. And Billy really, really was serious when he came to see me that day and told me this rather sad and tragic story. Fantastic. What a happy ending. Well, yes, he was, he was truly forgiven for the death of this young boy. Uh, when um, Bill died about six years ago, and um, I went to his funeral because I knew the man, and when I went to the interment at the local cemetery, there were two elderly gentlemen standing by the grave, and I had a diplomatic word with one of them, and he said, oh yes, we were all captured together on Crete by the Germans. And um, I mentioned the young boy, and they said, yes, Billy was looking after him. And he sent the young boy uh, to hide behind the ammunition truck, which had a, a metal tailgate, but a German sniper caught him in open ground. And that's what really affected Bill very, very badly. But seeing the young lad's ghost, he felt he'd been truly forgiven 
for the Death Fishing Boy all those years ago. And um, it's a very tragic but also a very true story. Mm. Okay. Simon, have you got any um, direct ghost stories where you've seen anything personally at all out of interest? Right. Uh, well, firstly, I'm not a medium. I'm not a psychic. I'm still not a clairvoyant. I do believe that there's another life after this one. I've always believed there is another life after this one. Uh, the only time I've ever felt anything uh, would be, uh, uh, strange enough, it wasn't actually a ghost walk. It was a trip to France uh, to a place called um, Ypres. And there's a place there called the Menin Gate. And I joined a, a guided tour there where we climbed on a coach and went to a place called the Sunken Lane. Now, the Sunken Lane is on the Somme battlefield. And um, it's a natural, natural limestone dip. And of course, in, in warfare, it would have been an ideal place to actually hide from enemy fire. And uh, the tour guide was a smashing chap called Robin, uh, Robin Williams. He was actually a Welsh lad, brilliant tour guide. And he showed us a video on the coach before we got to the sunken lane. And that video was of a group of uh, Lancashire Fusiliers, a rather famous Northern British Army regiment. And these men had all come back from Gallipoli. They were all highly professional soldiers. And their job was to look after a chap called Geoffrey Mallins. And Geoffrey Mallins was an early film pioneer. Uh, his job was to get into the sunken lane at night time. The sunken lane at that period of time in 1916 was very, very near the German lines. And the British and Commonwealth forces had been digging deep under the German lines and made this huge underground cavern and packed it with TNT. It was Mallins's job to film the explosion uh, and then, of course, the uh, the British Army will then make a huge dash to catch the crater, but get behind the German defences. You mentioned the spooky side. Well, I went and uh, I got to the coach first. And whilst uh, a group was having a, they were having a cigarette, if you will, and a bit of a chat outside the coach, I walked down the sunken lane by myself. And um, there were lots of wreaths in the in the hedgerow, lots uh, left by the Royal British Legion. And I suddenly felt I was being watched. And I turned round, and I didn't see anyone, but what I did hear was um, a, a German voice, uh, Wie gehst, uh, bist du, du glücklich, wie gehst, bist du glücklich, which I understood to be, um, how are you? Are you happy? But there was no one there, absolutely no one there. And um, I really, when I got back to the coach, I asked, were there uh, any other tourists in the area, any, um, any German tourists, etc. And uh, the guy said, we're the only coach here today which I did find quite intriguing. That's the only time I really couldn't explain anything. I love it when people say, I'm not clairvoyant or psychic, and then they give a story that's exactly clairvoyant and psychic. Even if it's just a one-off, it's, you know, that's that's pretty much it, isn't it? Well, you know, I think yeah. we all, you know, all have some uh, innate abilities, you know, some more than others. Sometimes it comes and goes, but... You know, I say that too. I always claim I'm not psychic, yet yeah, I can still remember some some things that that have happened. So I think it's just a part of our human existence. Okay, can we get uh, yeah. on with another one? Come on, I'm, I'm like a kid. Sorry, scared. such impatient. Goodness me. <laughs> uh, this, this is a rather beautiful story, actually. Uh, a very very beautiful story. We're going to turn the clock back to to 1642, and in October 1642, that's when we had what's called the English civil war and basically the war started because parliament parliament challenged the king king charles the first for the right to rule great britain the king didn't like it and uh, parliament didn't like it so therefore war started in october 1642. Uh, up in the north of england a lot of the towns such as blackburn burnley nelson Cone, clitheroe they wished to come under the new parliamentarian government they were parliamentarian towns if you will um, however, on the file coast, not too far from, shall we say, Preston and Blackpool, is a rather gorgeous building called Horton Towers. And Sir Gilbert Horton was an ardent supporter of King Charles I. He wrote to the king, Sir, I shall form a huge army and I shall capture all these northern towns and have the royal standard flying above all these towns by, uh, by Christmas Day, sir. He formed a huge army and they set off from the file coast right across Lancashire towards the town of Blackburn. They arrived at a place called Duke's Brow, which is a, shall we say, a hill, a dremlin overlooking Blackburn. He got all, all his cannon on top of the hill and they opened fire and cannonball after cannonball came raining down on the town of Blackburn. 
the town was quite fortunate to have two very, very good colonels, Colonel Starkey and Colonel Shuttleworth, both ardent supporters of the parliamentarian course, and they dug trenches. They told their men, right lads, we can expect an infantry attack at any minute. Keep your heads down behind the parapets. All of a sudden, the cannonballs stopped and there was silence on top of Duke's brow because a huge argument was taking place with um, with Horton and his men. His commanding officer said, Sir, we don't mind dying for you, sir. We don't mind dying for the king, sir. But it's Christmas Eve, sir. We should be with our families, sir. Attack Blackburn now, shouted Horton. I paid you. You've got equipment. You've got ammunition. You've got everything. Attack Blackburn now. But they about turned and set off back to the filed coast. In the meantime, Stark and Shuttleworth and the, uh, the trench systems in Blackburn thought, either they're retiring. We can cut them off at the top of the hill. And a rearguard action took place on top of Duke's Brow where ammunition was expended with quite a few casualties. We now pick up the story in 1995, where a lady who lives on top of Duke's Brow, um, she has rather a large house, and she decided to dig over her vegetable patch. She put a fork into the soil and turned the soil over, and up came a cannonball, followed by some musket balls, and what looked like a broken spur from a cavalry officer's boots. She'd heard about the Battle of Duke's Brow, and she put all these items inside a seed tray and then took the items into her home. She ran a very successful guest house. The telephone rang, and on the end of the telephone was an Australian voice. Uh, hello there, have you got a, a room for me? Wife and three kids were going to come over the Sarvo, going to stay in Blackburn for a couple of days over Christmas. Of course I have, she said. Uh, right, we'll see you this afternoon then. The Australian family arrived and she showed them to their rooms and she said, I'll just make you a nice cup of tea before you uh, settle in. She put the kettle on and then she heard the sound of hysterical shouting and screaming. And the Australian family came rushing down the corridor, literally pushed her to the side, jumped into their car and reversed at great speed out of the town. She thought, oh, that's really bad manners. Oh, no, I hope my dog hasn't made a mess in the front room. She made her way to the front room. She found the sofa, the settee on its side. She found a lampshade on the floor. And she also uh, noticed that a picture was hanging quite awkwardly off the wall. She told her husband. Her husband said, oh, don't worry, dear, don't worry. Australians, very strange people. But she was very upset. That night, she got a telephone call from the same Australian. Uh, so sorry about leaving your house in such a hurry, love. I'm not surprised. Well, what's the problem? Why did you leave in such a hurry? Well, my wife's just got over it. These three people came out of the wall, soldiers, straight from my wife and straight from my kids. What do you mean, soldiers, she said. Oh, yeah, the red coat soldiers, right from my wife and kids. They had bandoliers across the chest, right from my wife and kids, feathers in the cap. Well, that's thanks for telling me, she said. Well, it wasn't long before the story got into the local evening news. And then the National British Press also heard about the story. And two doctors from York University, two professors, arrived um, in Blackburn and they sat down with her and they said, right, dear, uh, just explain what, what happened and we'll have a look at the items you've dug up. And one of these professors said, what's happened to you, my dear, is Martindale syndrome. What do you mean, Martindale syndrome? Well, way back in 1952, in the city of York, behind York Minster, a young lad called Harry Martindale was working in the cellars. His job was to install central heating. Uh, he had a blowtorch, he had lead piping, he had copper piping, and he was bending the pipes to install central heating deep in the cellar. All of a sudden, he heard the sound of a trumpet that got louder and louder and louder, and he thought, oh, students up above. Then out of the wall, appeared this beautiful white horse with a Roman soldier on it that galloped past him, followed by platoon after platoon of Roman infantry. He could only see them to their knees and they looked very thin, very emaciated, and young Martindale scurried into the corner of the cellar as he watched these troops come out of the wall. He counted around 60 of them. They all looked very thin, very emaciated, uh, and very, very depressed, very sad and slightly dark skinned. As the last soldier went for the wall, he then heard the sound of the trumpet get loud, 
quieter and quieter, and then it faded away completely. He swallowed deeply. His heart hammered in his chest. He rushed upstairs and told his boss. His boss said, no, lad, get back down there again. We've got to get this job finished. We're on a contract. I can't. You're sacked. So poor Harry lost his job that afternoon. He walked for the city of York, down what's called Stonegate, this gorgeous little street, and into the oldest public house in the city itself, called Ye Old Star Inn. He got to the bar. There there was a, of all people, was a young journalist from the York Evening Press, whose words were, here lad, you look like you've seen a ghost. Well, actually, I've seen 60 of them this afternoon. Go on lad, tell me about it. And he told him all about what he'd seen the Roman soldiers in the cellar. And the journalist thought, well, it's getting towards Halloween. It sounds like a good story. We'll print it. When the story is printed, the half the city of York laughed at young Harry. But two weeks later, no one did, because some more work was going to take place in the cellar. They had to remove a lot more soil to install the central heating pipes. And as they removed the soil in the cellar, they were absolutely amazed to find a beautiful Roman road. And they came across a gorgeous piece of Roman stonework with the beautiful chiselled words into the stonework, Eberarchum. They had found the very entrance to the garrison of York from 2,000 years ago. And these professors believed that um, what Harry had seen that day was the ninth Hispanic unit leaving York for Carlisle, uh, where they were wiped up by the Celts just over the Scottish border. And when they went to Blackburn to talk to our lady from Duke's Brow, they said, my dear, you were the first person to pick up the cannonball, the uh, musket balls, and indeed, uh, and indeed the spur. You were the first person since 1642 to actually do that. And we believe that you somehow opened a time warp uh, to a different era and a different time. And who knows, that might be a good ghostly explanation for a lot of the sightings we see nowadays. Very, very nice. Irene? It's, uh, it's certainly a very haunting story, that one, isn't it? Very interesting. Irene? It's, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've heard of the uh, the whole Roman um, thing in York, certainly. Yeah, but, that's a famous uh, um, one, isn't it? it yeah, I'm strange but true was on in the 1990s with Michael Aspel, and and people could still view that on uh, on YouTube, um, and I think that was covered actually, um, and I think there was the, I think the story on um, going from memory on strange but true was was the same thing the guy doing work on basement and the whole Roman legion kind of walked past that, the spirit. That form. is the story, and interesting, Andrew. It, I, yeah, but this, this yeah, but what was mentioned was like a horse, but this what I'm talking about is like yes. a whole like. Um, yeah. like massive great big legion of them and it's 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 just mind blowing like because there's this theory that kind of like over time like ghosts can dissipate that kind of like this is why people see kind of mostly modern ghosts or victorian era ghosts but going back right to the roman times when when people find something um paranormal that's that's so forceful from roman period it's really it's really mind-blowing in terms of you know is it spirit activity is it like an impression that's left itself like the stone tape theory um you know what what's really going on there and the fact that the story i heard was that they could only see them from the knees up because they were walking that's the it, original yeah. road that's it mm. very strange that's amazing. You know, in a case like that, you you it wonder is, is it is it a time slip that you're seeing uh, some type of uh, obviously not you're seeing you're not seeing a whole legion of Roman ghosts walking down the road. It would I would think that that would be uh, you know some kind of um, residual effect like a time slip or something. If especially the fact that when they're walking on the road and their knees are cut off because the road is now higher than it was at that time. Yeah. That's quite correct. Yeah. I wonder if anyone's ever seen, and uh, this is a, um, an interesting question. Anyone seen like a caveman, like a Neolithic ghost? And if not, why not? You know, why why do we not see Iron Age ghosts? Why do we not see uh, Neolithic ghosts? You know, why don't we see kind of Neanderthal, early Neanderthal man ghosts? Um, why is that? Good point, really. Or dinosaur yeah. ghosts, for that matter. <laughs> oh, I, I really. Well, why, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Simon. You go ahead and and, and answer. Sure. Um, that, that's a, that's a very very good point, really. Um, 
what would have been marvellous for that day? I mean, Harry didn't expect to see these Roman soldiers. He really didn't. But um, the Treasurer's House uh, comes under the um, English heritage. They actually run the, the building to this very day. And um, I know in 2005, English Heritage had a party there, which is around Christmas time, actually. And uh, as the alcohol flowed, uh, one lady made her way to try and find the ladies' um, washroom, if you will. And um, she came back to the party and said, who's the who's the centurion at the top of the, the stairs? I said, well, there's no one dressed as a centurion here. But um, York was, of course, the one of the largest garrisons for the Romans 2,000 years ago. And uh, I'd, I'd, I would have absolutely loved to have had something like a TARDIS uh, mm. to have just gone back and looked at that, because it, York is one of those cities that does fascinate me, really. It's, uh, every street uh, comes from a different era. And uh, quite recently, um, these rather large skeletons were found quite near the museum. And um, they called in some experts, and they looked at the bones of these um, poor unfortunate characters, and they were huge. They took some enamel from their teeth and found they all came from North Africa. And these guys were actually gladiators. What really did shock quite a few people is on the um, on the bones, the femur, the scapula, tibias, were some unusual marks. And they found these marks being made by tigers or lions. And these guys had literally been thrown um, for entertainment purposes uh, to into the um, into these these amphitheatre type areas. Uh, for entertainment, but was to fought to the very, very death in uh, rather sad situations, really. Well, that's one thing you could say about the Romans. They sure knew how to throw mm. a party. Well, wow, those guys definitely did, didn't they, really? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you know, you were always hoped that you were an invitee and not the guest of honor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh, Irene, any comments? Sorry, no. I've got a small, <laughs> I've got a small paranormal experience I had in York actually in 2001. Fire away. Um, so yeah, I was visiting. I've got family up north, basically in um, in uh, Yorkshire and Harrogate area. And uh, although I've already visited the um, city previously when I was a, a kid, um, I went there in 2001. I think early 20s, and, and um, I didn't really know the city that well and I just kind of like went off and did my own thing. It was about evening time and I was in the old part and walking along the cobbled streets. Now, as I was walking along the cobbled streets, I was coming up to a certain area where I could see above the rooftop, I could see the cathedral of York Cathedral. And I got kind of like a really depressed type feel and I kind of thought, do you know what, weirdly, I don't know why, but I think that might have been the last thing that some people might have seen. I, I couldn't explain yeah. why and I kept walking along and I kept th thinking it's almost as if like people might have been executed and like that was the, literally the last thing the cathedral as I went around the corner I kid you not looking across there was um it was basically a little square and there was a pub there called the last drop in and they had like a triangle of gallows where you would hang three people at once um, and sure enough kind of going around the corner there was a little kind of uh, stage bit um, kind of like a stone wall bit and a little plaque saying that this is like the, the hanging spot in, in York and um, that was kind of like a, the first inklings of kind of like the psychic side of things with me personally This is a fabulous city I've got to say York really for any overseas tourist um, York is definitely within the top three locations for anyone from overseas and uh, uh, I've been going for many, many years because I do tours in the city myself sometimes, and I uh, never, uh, never get tired of it. Sorry, so you, you, you know you know the spot that I was talking about, the the last drop yes. in. You, you, the yeah. of the pub. Well, um, I, I do know the area very well, but uh, you, I, I love the way you mentioned that the minster would be the last thing you'd ever see, really, and. Um, mm. Uh, it, it is a strikingly amazing building, isn't it? And, you know, way back in 1967, York Minster was in danger of actually collapsing. And um, um. because it's a national treasure, the government came in immediately. And they called in some experts, and those experts came from, would you believe, Sweden. And they worked <laughs> out how to save the Minster. But they thought the, the foundations are all flooded. And so they sent frogmen down there. And these guys went down there <laughs> And they found beneath the actual foundations a Roman road and Roman buildings. And they thought, right, let's kill two birds with one stone here. And they called in 
mm. uh, professionals who could save the minster from collapsing, but also to open the Roman world beneath it to the public. And they have done. And you can walk down this Roman street and see Roman uh, alabaster plaster, and you can see how they've constructed their own sewage system down there, which looks like a modern piece of architecture. Absolutely amazing people, really. But uh, York is one of those places that you could spend you know, a good seven days there, and you'd, you'd do something new every day, every day. And of course, there's a, there's a very strong Viking background in York as well, isn't there? Uh, the Jorvik Centre, again, um, if any new buildings are mm. built in York, the first thing they do is bring in the university. And they look at the ground first, because nearly every every inch of York comes from a different era and a different time. And uh, way back in 1975, I think it was, they found a Viking settlement. And they thought, right, great tourist attraction, let's build the museum on top of the Viking settlement. and. Uh, Within the first year, um, I think that it, the museum actually paid for itself because you'll see queues and queues and queues of tourists making their way to the Jorvik Center. But uh, some of the um, artifacts in there are just fantastic. You've got um, the Coppergate helmet, one of the finest Viking helmets ever found in Great Britain. Uh, you find shoes that look like they've just come out of the out of the box, really good quality leather. Uh, but Jorvik, uh, as you go there, you can go what's called a time capsule. You sit in this little car if you will and it takes you right around the whole complex uh you go into viking buildings you go into um uh, into the village and they've uh, brought in traditional music from that period of time uh they've even created smells would you believe of apples and uh, pig swill etc etc and it really does come across very well yep that's that's exactly what i did in uh, 2001 definitely i know exactly what the what you're talking about there and the little thing uh, the pods that you go around in the museum yeah, is, um, oh, I would yeah, recommend pods, yeah. anyone listening to this yeah a- anyone listening to this in America if you're heading to uh, Britain definitely definitely do go to York and the York Museum um, oh, yeah. very very much worth it especially if you're into very history much. very very much so um, so Simon what other kind of something to tell us uh, sure um Let's have another Christmas-themed ghost story. Uh, We are going to turn the clock back now to 1874, and there is a slight connection with the United States and this next story. Um, I live up in Lancashire, which is a a northern county, and Lancashire was the very, very hub of world textiles. All the cotton, of course, came from Louisiana, Mississippi, and Egypt, and these vessels full of cotton would arrive in the city of Liverpool. Waiting for them was a gentleman called Jonathan Martindale. John T. Martindale. Uh, no relation to our Harry in York, but he just had the same name, would he be? John T. Martindale. And John T. would take samples from each of the bales. He'd put the um, samples in a leather pouch and then go and see the textile barons of Lancashire and Yorkshire. Um, his coach arrived in Preston, the city of Preston, outside a lovely old inn, which is still there to this very day, called the Stanley Arms. He got out of the coach. His coat was so cold, it had nearly frozen to his body. He rushed inside the Stanley Arms and felt the, the rays of heat from the fireplace. And um, he then met the cotton barons and gave them his order book and said, gentlemen, could you please fill in the order book very, very quickly? My wife is expecting our first child, and I promised I'd be by her side when she gives birth. She could go into labour at any minute. Oh, Mr Martindale, said the, uh, the landlord, John Nicholson, there's a meal for you there and a nice warm drink. Your coach and horses have just gone on the back of the inn. They're being fed and watered. You'll be on your way very, very soon. He consumed his drink very quickly and enjoyed enjoyed the meal. He then paced the front of the room, looking out of the window. Where's that coach? It's got to come soon. I've got to get back home. He was getting very, very agitated. It became dark and he looked out of the window of the inn and there, just slightly illuminated by the moonlight, he could see six horses and a coach. He could just make out on the side of the door the words, Lancaster, Manchester. Ah, that's my coach. He climbed on board the coach and sat down inside. Inside, it smelt very damp. It smelt very musty. 
As his eyes became accustomed to the light, inside the coach were two other people that gave the impression to be female. Uh, sitting next to him was a lady with a very long Victorian bonnet that seemed to be sleeping with her head bowed down. In front of him, another lady, long Victorian bonnet, also with her head sloped downwards, but a baby wrapped up in a blanket on her knee that seemed to be asleep as well. Inside the coach, it smelt very damp, it smelt very musty, and he tried to get a conversation going. Uh, excuse me, ladies, uh, would you mind, please, if I just open the window? Uh, it's not very nice in here, really. No answer. The coach jutted forward and made its way to the city centre of Preston. Martindale made another request. Uh, excuse me, ladies, uh, would you mind, please, if I just open the window? No answer. In a fit of temper, he stood up and reached for the leather strap attached to the window. He tugged it, and to his horror, half the window casing came away in his hands. He then heard a scream. He turned to the right, and the elderly lady with the long Victorian bonnet had slowly lifted a face to look at him. And where there should have been a face was a hollow, dark cavity. Martindale screamed in terror. He fell out of the coach and banged his head on the road and was knocked unconscious. He came round some five, ten minutes later in a swirling, swirling blizzard. He then made his way from the town centre back to the Stanley Arms, and as he walked inside the old inn, the landlord Nicholson said, Mr Martindale, what's happened to you? Let me, let me dress that head wound. Well, I got in a coach, this woman should have no face, this woman should have a baby. Mr Martindale, calm down, calm down. Your coach is still around the back of the inn, and if you look outside, the snow is so deep and so thick that any coach that arrived would have definitely left an imprint. Martindale spent the night at the Stanley Arms. The following day, the snow being cleared, his original coach and horses were ready for him, and he got back to his home just in time to watch the birth of his baby daughter. He never forgot that night. What we do know that year was 1874. In 1872, the Lancaster, Manchester, left Preston for the city of Manchester. To get there, it had to go over a place called Geoffrey Hill, a very dangerously exposed area. High winds that night blew the coach off the road and down the ravine, killing six horses, a driver, an elderly lady, and a young woman and her baby. Martindale was convinced that that night he got in that very, very coach. Christmas 19, 1874. Wow. We need some spooky music, music to go in this, Mark. <laughs> These old coaching ends. I love them, Aaron, don't you? Oh, I do. I stay, in, I stay in as many as I can. Whenever I'm off on my travels, I always make sure I stay in a coaching inn. They're beautiful. I mean, in, in England, we've got so many of them. Well, there's so yeah. many across Britain. What's a little bit sad, Aaron, is that we're losing 350 inns a month in Great Britain. That's right. Um, it's a terrible shame when you see an inn that survived the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s. But this last recession seems to really, really hit an awful lot of good old inns, really. Yeah, they're closing down all over the place. But... All over Great Britain. Yeah, but I always make sure it's coaching him. You know, you've got the actual area where the, you know, like the, the um, oh, what do they call it, where the coaches go through into the yard at the back. Yes, courtyards, yeah. Yeah. It's Beautiful. Be a coach, you know. I love them. I really do. And I've stayed in quite, quite a few all over the place. Yes. Yeah. Simon, have you got any stories about Jack that you can give us? Well, I, I, um, it's a great story, isn't it? I mean, that's a, an absolutely magnificent story. Um, I've actually done ripper tours with other guides over the years. But what I can tell you... Uh, as we all know, Jack the Ripper was never, ever found. There were many, many suspects, many, many suspects that took the life of uh, poor old um, Catherine Eddowes, Margaret Kelly, and Chapman, Lizzie Stride, and Coates. Um, but um, there were many, many suspects. One was actually an American doctor called Dr. Tumblety. And um, for some strange reason, he was actually in the city of London in 1888. And he'd actually gone to one of the hospitals and asked if you could actually buy, this does sound rather crude, but it's very true, actually buy 
some uteruses uh, for medical experiments. Uh, as we do know, um, two of the victims uh, actually had uh, kidneys and were terribly uh, disfigured, but uh, uteruses are ruined as well. And uh, many people believe that Dr. Thomas may have been the character. But many years later, in the city of Liverpool, a gentleman called Mr. James Maybrick uh, was brought into the equation. Maybrick uh, was a very, very wealthy textile baron, and he would make his way down to the city of uh, London on a regular basis uh, to show us say, um, look at the young ladies in Whitechapel, if you will. He was a drug addict, and um, in the early 1950s, um, in his home, a diary was found, and the diary uh, related to his trips down to the city of London. And uh, the diaries looked at very, very clearly. And what did amaze everyone is that uh, he was in the city every time when these young ladies disappeared. It's very, very likely he would have known them or come across them, but uh, whether he was Jack the Ripper, we'll never, ever, ever know. The biggest suspect was a chap called Aaron Kosminski. And Kosminski was a, uh, a Polish immigrant. He was a butcher and would have uh, been quite used to, shall I say, um, butchering animals, but also removing things like kidneys and other items uh, for sale. But it is an intriguing story. And uh, what I find just a little bit sad is that um, parts of the original uh, city of London on that tour, some were destroyed in the Blitz, of course. And uh, in the case of um, where Lizzie Stride was murdered, that's now a brewery. But um, anyone visiting the City of London, uh, I've got to say, uh, uh, the, the, the Ripper tours are fantastic. And although we're talking about a, a maniac, an absolute maniac, you can actually walk into history on these tours. What would you say is your favourite tour or, uh, or, or favourite area where it's the most story assignment? Uh, well, I conduct uh, yeah, a lot of it. tours in uh, Langshire, Yorkshire and Cumbria. Uh, one of my, um, again, we, uh, I suppose this really is a story not too dissimilar to the York, uh, to the, um, the famous Whitechapel murders. But uh, I live quite near the town of Blackburn and I do a, a tour in Blackburn called Heroes and Villains. And uh, we'll turn the clock back to the 25th of October, 1875. And a nine-year-old girl called... Emily Holland is walking home. She's walking home with her two brothers through the streets of Blackburn, and as she walks past an old inn called the Wheat Chief, she just disappeared. Her two brothers turn round and thought, where's Emily gone to? That's strange, she's just disappeared. They got back home, and as you can imagine, Emily's mother and father were absolutely distraught. They said, where's Emily? Well, she just disappeared. What do you mean? disappeared. You should have stayed with her. Well, we did. She just disappeared. So Emily's mother and father rushed down to the, the town centre of Blackburn and they made their way to the local police station. There they met Detective Livesey, Inspector Potts and Inspector Elliot. And there they uh, set up uh, patrols of the town searching the whole of Blackburn. After seven long days, they said to Emily's mother and father, we're so sorry. We can't find her anywhere. An hour later, a gentleman called Mr. Peter Fairclough took his dog for a walk in the nearby town of Great Harwood. The dog went into the park and the dog came out of the park with some newspaper in its mouth, saturated in blood. Get that out your mouth, he said, get that out your mouth. He got hold of the newspaper and tugged it and out fell a child's limb. Uh, Fairclough was, as you can imagine, deeply upset. It wasn't long before um, Livesey, uh, Elliot and Potts arrived and uh, they ascertained that the limb belonged to nine-year-old Emily Holland. And that day they told the parents that it's very likely the child had indeed been murdered. An hour later, a Mrs White from North Blackburn was walking to work and she tripped over some more newspapers saturated in blood. She picked up the newspapers and opened them and was horrified to find the torso of a child in there. Uh, Blackburn police arrived and they took the remains to the mortuary in Blackburn police station and Inspector Elliot said, I've got it. Whoever committed this despicable murder on this nine-year-old girl committed it in a barber shop. If you look inside the newspaper, there's lots of hair belonging to different human beings. It's a barber who's committed these murders. 
they went to every barber shop in the town of Blackburn and they came across um, a shop owned by a chap called Mr. William John Fish. Fish was 25 years old, he had a wife and two daughters and was considered to be quite a respectable person. As the police went into his shop they saw a large pile of the local newspaper, the Lancashire Telegraph. And um, Inspector Elliot had actually taken down the names and numbers of the pages used to wrap the poor girl's organs in, and that paper was missing. Uh, Mr. Fish, where's last week's Lancashire Telegraph? Uh, uh, oh, I used it this morning, sir, to light the fire. And they accepted his story. The police went back to the police station and they looked out of the window and they saw a billboard from the local newspaper. Blackburn police, incompetent. Blackburn police no nearer to catching maniac. This upset them, but they couldn't get a single lead. A week passed, another week passed, and these billboards were getting more and more aggressive. A local mill owner called John Hornby put up £100 to anyone who could find the murderer. And the Home Office in London thought, this man's made a big effort, we, sh we too shall put a £100 uh, reward to find the murderer. Now, £200 in 1875, that's an awful lot of money. Who should pick up the gauntlet but a young boy of 12 years old in the nearby town of Preston called Peter Levine? He wrote to Blackburn Police. Um, sir, I've got a little dog, sir. It's called Morgan, sir. He's a collie lurcher cross, sir. He's got a marvellous sense of smell. He'll find a murderer. The police had a good laugh at the letter and looked out of the window. And that day, the billboards were getting very, very aggressive. Blackburn police useless. Blackburn police incompetent. No nearer to catching maniac. They thought, well, let's bring this young lad in. We, we, we've tried everything. They met young Peter at the railway station with this little dog called Morgan that was shivering on the cold. Uh, they brought the dog down to the police station and Peter said, Sir, my dog just needs to get a scent from the newspapers and he'll find your murderer. The police had a bit of a laugh over this and they took the dog down to the mortuary and they brought up the remains of poor Emily. Morgan started to bark hysterically as he sniffed at the newspapers and started scratching at the mortuary door. They opened the door and this little dog rushed through the town centre, straight onto Darwin Street, onto King Street and straight to William John Fisher's barber's shop. Fish looked out of the frosty glassed window uh, as he saw these three police officers arriving with young Peter and the dog and they hammered on the door. He opened the door, the dog went through his legs and straight towards the fireplace and started barking at the fireplace. Peter shouted, sir, me dog knows there's something up that chimney, sir. He knows there's something up the chimney, sir. Right, arrest Fish immediately. Elliot handcuffed him whilst Detective Livesey knelt down and reached behind the chimney breast. He found some more paper. He brought the paper out and he opened it and was horrified to find the charred skull of young Emily Holland. Well, Fish was given a good hiding. In those days, the police were allowed to be a bit more persuasive than they are nowadays. He was taken down to the police station where he confessed the murder and said on the day of the murder, I'd been drinking quite heavily. When young Emily came past, I grabbed her. He then committed a terrible offence on this nine-year-old girl. He was then horrified what he'd done and thought, I can't let her get to the outside world, and he strangled her. He then wrapped his, her body in his cloak and took her body back to the barber shop and tried to dissect the body. He obviously didn't do a very good job. What I can tell you is Fish was then sent down to Liverpool and executed the murder of young Emily. But our story doesn't really end there because William Fish became the very, very first person from the county of Lancashire in the north of England ever to be a Madame Two Swords waxwork dummy was on display from 1875 to 1905 and was literally known simply as the Blackburn Butcher. Very interesting. <laughs> mm. And also possibly one of the first murders to be solved by a psychic dog. <laughs> well, 
The dog had a fantastic sense of smell, and uh, it is an intriguing story. It would make a great film. It really, really would. Uh, what I can tell you is because um, Peter Levine was just a, a 12-year-old boy, his mother and father, they got the money that was put up by Mr. Hornby and indeed uh, the uh, Home Office. And they spent it before the lad became 18. So he never saw a penny of his hard labours, really. But um, it's a great story, a really intriguing story. Hmm, that's a bit unfair on the poor lad, isn't it? I think so, I think so. But um, Morgan must have been, a, it was a lurcher, collie cross and very, very good sense of smell. And uh, even nowadays, of course, bloodhounds are still used by police forces across the world to, to find, uh, to sniff out um, anything from uh, drugs to, to blood to uh, to convicts, of course. Well, but but would a dog um, have the you know the the scent to smell of that kind of distance? I mean, when it first arrived into the town, right up to the the shop of Mister Fish, that's that's quite. I should imagine it's a fair distance, and also presumably the shop. I don't know if the door was open or not, but if it was a closed door, you know, how how could it have that much of a sense of smell for that distance behind a closed door? It must have known exactly where to go to. Uh, mm. Instead of scratching the door outside. And uh, it, it must have had I mean, incredible instinct. It was an incredible instinct, really. Uh, from yeah. Fisher's shop to the police station, you're looking at probably, probably four or five blocks to get there, really. But um, it is an intriguing story and yeah. well documented. Well documented. Okay, do you want to tell us another story? That one was quite good. Yeah, let's uh, continue with the, the Christmas theme. Yeah. Um, we're going to make our way towards the city of Manchester, one of the largest cities in the north of England. And uh, through the city of Manchester, you've got what's called the East Lancashire Railway Line. And um, one, of the, one of the towns that the line goes through is a town called Darwin. And living by the side of the railway line in a little cottage way back in the 19, 1930s was a young boy called Bill Morris. And Bill loved the railway line with all his heart. And he told his mum and dad, when I leave school, I'm going to work on the railways. As the trains went past the bottom of his garden, he would wave to the engine drivers and they'd always respond by pulling the whistle cord and you'd hear the famous <whistles> as the train went past. You're good at that. <laughs> uh, at the age of uh, 15, he left school and got a job on the, on the railway line as a wheel tapper. His job was to literally wait for the goods trains to come into the station. He would tap the wheels, and if they had a good ring to it, they were A-OK. -okay. If there was a dull thud, then the uh, the wheels had to be changed. At the age of 18, he then became a fireman on a steam locomotive. And just after his 21st birthday, he became a steam engine locomotive driver. He got the job of his dreams. He worked from London, Euston, right up to Glasgow, and down from Glasgow, down to London. And in the summer of 1952, he was absolutely delighted to be transferred to his beloved East Lancashire Railway Line. And when he went past his parents' house, he would actually pull the cord. <whistles> as the train went past the, the, the home. On a beautiful summer's day, he was bringing down some freight from the city of Carlisle down to city of Manchester, and he had to go through a tunnel called the Suff Tunnel, which is just outside Manchester. And as the train was about to go into the tunnel, he glanced to his right and saw a field. And behind um, the wire fencing was a young boy with straw-coloured hair. And the little boy waved at Bill, and Bill waved back and... <whistles> as the train went into the tunnel. Bill saw this young boy every single day for the next five weeks. The little lad was always waiting at exactly the same area behind the fencing near the tunnel entrance. One day, in bright, bright sunshine, Bill set off from Carlisle and made his way towards the tunnel entrance and glanced to his right. The little boy was in a different part of the field and as the little boy saw the train arriving, he started to run. And Bill noticed with absolute amazement, the young boy was running through sleeping sheep. It's as if the sheep didn't even know he was there. He was running through them. Uh, Bill elbowed the fireman, look, look at that. 
the farmer looked up as the train went into the tunnel and said, I'm sorry, mate, I'm too busy shoveling. The train went into the tunnel down to Manchester and they changed their freight in the city of Manchester and went to the buffet on the bar on the station for a cup of tea and a sandwich. And the farmer said, Bill, you've been really, really quiet. What's the problem? Well, it's that young lad. You know, the young lad we've seen near the tunnel entrance. Today, he was in a different part of the field and I saw him running towards us, but he was running through sleeping sheep. It's as if the sheep didn't even know he was there. Oh, no, no, you're seeing things, said the fireman. Well, they coupled up with their new freight and made the journey back up north again. And as they were about to enter the Suffolk Tunnel from the Manchester side, they saw a red light in the distance. Uh, Bill slowed the locomotive down and saw that the light was being held by a police officer. Uh, what's wrong, officer? Oh, terrible. Absolutely terrible. There's been a young lad killed at the tunnel entrance. Oh, officer, that's terrible. Terrible. It is. We just told the young lad's parents this afternoon. And what's really sad is that his brother was killed there six years ago. Oh, officer, that is terrible, said Bill. Word came through that the tunnel was now open for traffic again. And Bill took the locomotive through the tunnel and he came out into beautiful bright sunlight and glanced to his left. He saw the straw-coloured haired boy there holding the hand of a much taller boy. They both waved at the engine and as Bill waved back he saw them both literally fade away into thin air. He elbowed the fireman. Look, did you see that? Uh, no, too busy shoveling, mate. Bill never saw them again, but he knew what he saw that day was indeed the two ghostly boys that sadly lost their lives at the entrance of the tunnel at different times of their lives. A very touching, but very, very gripping story from Christmas 1952. Wow. That's sad, isn't it? It is sad. Very, very tragic story. Yeah. Yeah. Next one. <laughs> Keep them coming. Simon. <laughs> Hello. Simon, do you have any stories um, about either a possibility of the ghost of Charles Dickens or anything along the lines of the Christmas Carol story that may be based on any kind of reality or experiences or anything similar? I don't know if it exists or not, so I'm just asking. Um, I'm a great fan of Charles Dickens. I think he was a magnificent, magnificent writer. Um, strange enough, I do a tour at a place called Salmsbury Hall. If you go into the Google search and put Salmsbury Hall in, it's one of the most gorgeous Tudor buildings in the whole of Great Britain. Uh, built around 1322 and still standing to this very, very day. Charles Dickens would go there on a regular basis. Uh, the hall was owned by the Southworth family in the Victorian period, and there were rather wealthy people the Southworths, and uh, they did in fact invite Dickens there on a few occasions. Um, I just think he had a brilliant mind, a brilliant mind. And you look at all those books he wrote. Um, I think The Christmas Carol's a gorgeous story, isn't it, really? It's a gorgeous story. It's more of, more of a warning, isn't it, really, about uh, being... I mean, Scrooge was a very selfish man, wasn't he, really? A very greedy man. Well, it's almost and a he morality his, tale, you know. He turned his life around beautifully, didn't he, really, in the end? He really, really did. So that, that's more of a novel, really. But um, um, I can tell you some gorgeous stories from... Sarsby Hall, if you'd like. Please do, go for it. Okay. Um, we're now going to turn the clock back to 1923. Sarsby Hall is in a terrible state of disrepair. It's a beautiful Tudor building. Huge holes have appeared in the roof of the main hall. The long gallery is in danger of collapsing. Local builders gather like a flock of vultures to take away all the stone, all the timber to be used for buildings outside the area. On the 11th hour, the Sarnsby Hall Preservation Society are formed. And these consist really of wealthy entrepreneurs and historians, and they raise enough money to save Sarnsby Hall from falling down. Now, they can't let any Tom, Dick and Harry uh, work uh, on uh, buildings of this kind. They have to have someone that's highly skilled in medieval buildings. One such person fitted the bill beautifully and do wait for his name, 
Mr. Michael Palin, no relation to our Monty Python star whatsoever. He was an extremely clever man when it came to res restoration of medieval buildings. He'd worked on Bodlewithan Castle in North Wales. He'd worked in Mancaster in Cumbria, Levens Hall in South Lakeland, and Bram Hall in Cheshire. He knew his stuff. He arrived on a beautiful, beautiful June day with his four apprentices, and he gave each apprentice a different part of the hall to work on. He chose the oldest part of the building and got his ladder and climbed up the main hall wall to look at the stonework, which was in a terrible state, with a hammer and chisel. He chiseled away and dropped a huge block of stone from the roof down to the floor. He was horrified to see standing at the bottom of the ladder, a little boy with curly black hair. The stone came down at great speed, grazing his nose and landing at his feet. And Palin shouted, look out, stand back, stand back. The little boy didn't even move. The stone grazed his nose and landed at his toes. Palin came down that ladder at great speed to give this lad a piece of his mind. He could have been badly injured or even killed, but the role was completely reversed. The little boy shouted, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't be here. Mr. Southall won't like it, you shouldn't be here. Well, I've got a right to be here, lad. You stand back, you could have been badly injured. He turned round and climbed up the ladder. The little boy had gone. That's strange. He must be a quick runner, thought Palin. Well, for the next five months, they worked their socks off, bringing new timber, new tiles, new casings, and the hall was beginning to look a bit like its 1322 self once again. They arrived on a bitterly cold December day, Christmas Eve, 1923. The blue sky disappeared and huge clouds full of snow appeared from nowhere and heavy, heavy snow came down from the heavens. Before long, all the roads in that southern hall were clogged with snow and Michael told his four boys, I'm sorry lads, you'll have to spend the night here. There's no way we'll get back home tonight. We'll have to spend the night here at the hall. The four lads complained bitterly. It was Christmas day the following day, but even they realized that outside was this terrible blizzard, the sort of blizzard none of them had seen before. Michael said, it'll get dark by half past four. What we'll do boys, we'll go into the woods, we'll get lots of firewood, and we shall bring the firewood inside and keep the fire going in the main hall. They rushed into the forest, they came back with branches and twigs, and they had a huge pile of firewood. They got a, a roaring fire going in the main hall. Now, uh, in those days, no mobile phones, no radios, no television. The only form of entertainment would be a good night's sleep, really. The four lads got their bed rolls and rolled them out in front of the fire and fell into a deep, deep sleep. Michael was about to join them. Uh, he was an ardent Christian and he clasped his hands together to pray to the good Lord before he settled down for the night. And he glanced to his right and there in the corner of the main hall, he saw a golden glowing light. Out of that golden glowing light, suddenly stepped a very, very beautiful young lady in Tudor dress. She very elegantly made her way past Palin, knelt down in between the sleeping apprentices in front of the fire and prayed to the good Lord. She whispered the words, I hope my husband survives the war. Then she just literally vaporized, but left a crackle in the air, a sweet scent. Palin's mouth went dry. His heart hammered in his chest. He nervously, nervously glanced to the right and saw from the same entrance where the Tudor girl had appeared, another golden glowing light. And out of that golden glowing light, suddenly stepped an English cavalier officer. Typical 1642 officer. He made his way to the fireplace, put his hand on the top of the mantelpiece above the fireplace and uttered the words, I hope I survive the war. He too disappeared. Palin has just witnessed two very, very unusual paranormal events and is quite literally mortified. He nervously glanced to the right again and saw a much smaller glowing light. And out of that glowing light stepped the little boy 
with the curly black hair that had nearly been hit by the stone that came down uh, from Palin's chisel in June of that year. The little boy ran past Palin and straight through the sleeping apprentices and out of the wall. Quite surprisingly, Palin didn't sleep well that night, but surprisingly, when the four lads woke up, he didn't tell them what had happened. And when he got back to his home uh, near Manchester, he didn't tell his wife and children. He told no one. But some 22 years later, at the height of World War II, he was walking past the hall, as he had done on many occasions, to admire his handiwork. And he saw outside the hall a military vehicle belonging to the Royal Air Force. He thought, ah... AF. What are they doing there? He made his way into the building and uh, walked to the main hall and there he saw two Royal Air Force personnel admiring one of the portraits of the South of family. Uh, as the door clicked, they turned round and Palin made eye contact with the young lady in the RAF uniform. He just stood and stared at her. Uh, quite naturally, she felt very, very embarrassed. Uh, may I help you? May I help you? Her partner, the uh, male officer, in, uh, interrupted. Uh, Can we help you, please, sir? Palin recognised the young girl in the RAF uniform to be the same beautiful young lady he had seen walk out of that golden glowing light in the Tudor dress in 1923. He told her. She burst into tears. Uh, Mr Palin, I don't disbelieve a word you've told me, but I'm from the city of Leicester. I have never, ever been to Lancashire in my life before, but as we drove past this building in the staff car, I shouted, stop, stop, stop. I know this place. I have been here before, and you, Mr. Palin, have just answered my anxieties. Oh, so she was a reincarnation. I believe that was the case, Irene, yes. I love them sort of stories. You, you know, this type of story fascinates the hell out of me because when you try to understand it, and this is one of those things maybe you can never understand, why Mr. Palin would see these figures come out, first the wife praying for her husband, then the husband shows up and, and prays for his wife. You know, the... That's not a coincidence event. I mean, I could see maybe the woman showing up and praying for her husband, and then that's it, and then he meets her later on. But then when the, the husband also shows up doing the same thing, hoping he survives, you know, obviously, there, it, it seems like there's a message in there. Uh, whether yes. it's from Palin yeah. or, or who, but, you know, especially all those years later when the young woman shows back up. Uh, I mean, it, the story gives you chills. It's a very, very touching story, but such a... A, a, a beautiful old building and um, the very very fabric inside that building seems to just lend itself for storytelling um, in that very very room is a gorgeous fireplace which we just mentioned but the fireplace actually holds a very very sinister secret um, the fireplace was designed by a gentleman called Nicholas Owen now Nicholas Owen was a priest hole designer. Uh, way back in the year 1536, King Henry VIII outlawed the Catholic faith in Great Britain. And anyone preaching Catholicism would be treated as a traitor. A lot of families in the north of England uh, refused to accept the new Anglican religion and became Catholics to the very, very end. Uh, of course, if they were caught at um, Catholic masses, they would indeed be interned or indeed executed. The family that owned Salisbury Hall employed Mr. Nicholas Owen. Nicholas Owen was an absolute genius. He would design priest holes. Some of his work is so good, it hasn't been discovered. And you can pick up the national British press and on occasions you'll read little articles of a cleaning lady uh, from any of the counties in, in the country who's been working and accidentally kicked a fire hearth or accidentally uh, removed a, a panel and the roof is lowered or a fireplace is opened. His work was absolutely magnificent. Uh, King Henry VIII's orders were to catch this man because he was looked on as a real enemy of the state. He worked all over the country installing these incredible priest holes which were places to hide the priests, beautifully camouflaged and works of art. 
He was um, actually arrested in 1606 in Somerset, in the south of England, sent to the Tower of London. His only crime was to be a member of the Catholic faith. The poor man was hung, drawn and quartered, a very, very cruel and painful death. If you go to the Tower of London, you will see an area, if you excuse the pun, called the Bloody Tower. It's um, a pretty horrific part of the Tower of London. And you'll see scratch into the alabaster, in the plaster, a uh, gorgeous handwriting of Anne Boleyn, uh, Lady Jane Penn, Sir Walter Raleigh. I've seen and, that. And beneath that, you'll also see, of course, uh, Nicholas Owen. This yeah. day, I will oh, be... Oh, yeah, with... I've seen that, but I didn't notice or uh, even very, think about uh, him. Yeah, I mean, they're works of art, aren't they? I mean, they are... They're actually medieval graffiti, which are worth an absolute fortune. Yeah, I say. Absolute fortune. And uh, I know the staff at the Tower have put perspex over them all now, so you can look at them, but you can't touch them because they are literally priceless, absolutely priceless. But uh, Nicholas they're Owen... Um, they? Bring I said they're irreplaceable. Irreplaceable, that's what I'm mm. hearing, yes. OK, what was wrong there, Mark? Oh, nothing. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, I'm good. Oh, something was going on. <laughs> okay. okay. Are you getting tired yet, Simon? Uh, I've got to, a few more stories. As long as you're happy, folks, go, I feel go, go, perfectly go. happy. Yeah, please, please. We'll take more. your time. You know, uh, spin so, away. There are some lovely stories. Um, uh, I've got a really nice one for you here, actually. Well, when I say nice, probably not not so much for the uh, some of the characters, but um, we will turn the clock back to 1745. And um, at that period of time, uh, up in Eriksay, now Eriksay is in the Outer Hebrides, up in Scotland, and a gentleman called Bonnie Prince Charlie, known simply as the Young Pretender, arrived from France. He was a steward, a Catholic, and he was on a mission, and that mission was to become the King of England. And he had, of course, a lot of Scottish support. The Scottish clans met him and he formed a huge army in the Highlands and then made his way down to the city of London with the intention of taking London and proclaiming himself King of England. Now, quite surprisingly, we always associate the Jacobite Rebellion with just the Scots, but up in the north of England, there were a lot of English sympathisers who also wanted to see a Catholic on the throne of England once again. One of them being this rather brave chap from a beautiful hall near the town of Burnley in the north of England called Francis Townley. Very, very wealthy man. He'd been educated in Paris. He could speak fluent French, uh, but he was um, an Englishman to the core, if you will, but also a Catholic. And he formed the Manchester Regiment. And when Bonnie Prince Charlie came down through Carlisle, through Penrith, through Kendal, down to Lancaster, he was met by Colonel Francis Townley and his English Manchester Regiment. And they joined the Jacobite Rebellion. They set off down to Derbyshire and they stopped in Derbyshire, which is a bit silly, really, because they could have continued to the city of London. It could have been a fear of what lay ahead. It could have been a fear of uh, supply problems. But when they got to the town of Derby, they stopped. And that's when the prince said, no, I'm frightened about what lays ahead. They had no idea in London, everyone's taking their money out of the banks. The French army are just waiting to invade. They just need to be given the word, but the word never came. In the meantime, the English Redcoats and the Duke of Cumberland and General Wade, who was later to become heavily involved in the American War of Independence, uh, set up up north and started to push the Jacobites right up to the Scottish border, to the Scottish border town, English border town of Carlisle. And there Colonel Francis Townley and his Manchesters held off the English redcoats for three days until they were captured. And Colonel Francis Townley said to the Duke of Cumberland, I wish to be treated as a prisoner of war. You're no prisoner of war. You are a traitor to your country. He was taken down to Newgate Prison in London, put on trial and found guilty of treason. There the poor chap was indeed hung, drawn and quartered, his head locked off and placed in a pike at Temple Bar in London. His poor wife Mary made the long journey from Burnley down to the city of London to retrieve her husband's head. 
and brought the head back to Burnley, where it was placed in a wickerwork basket with a nap over the top of it and placed in the chapel. It was then placed in the, uh, the chapel itself behind some oak panelling. In 1901, the last of the town is passed away and the town council of Burnley are responsible for the upkeep of Townley Hall to this very day. In 1902, an inquisitive council worker made his way in inside the chapel and removed one of the oak panels and found Colonel Francis Townley's head. Um, it still had some matted hair on top of it and there was a hole where the pike had gone through it. The head was then taken to St Peter's Church and interned in the local cemetery there. But that's when strange things happened at Townley Hall. Um, mainly in the last 30 years when a burglar system was installed in this beautiful old hall. Burnley police got sick and tired of being called out in the early hours of the morning to go to the hall um, to look at break-ins. When they got to the hall, the building was never broken into, but the burglar alarms had gone off. One sergeant in 1989 uh, took two officers into the hall, they put the lights on and the officer made his way up the spiral staircase to what's called the Long Gallery. As he walked down the long gallery, he had an eerie, eerie feeling. He felt his, someone was walking behind him. He very, very nervously slowly turned round and was gaping at a headless corpse. And as he looked down, he saw the head was actually in the arm. He screamed in terror, ran down the stairs at great speed, back to the police station where his colleagues laughed at him, apart from one man the desk sergeant, the duty sergeant. He said, look, I believe you. I've been a Bobby in Burnley for some 25 years, and I too have seen the ghost of Colonel Francis Townley, minus his head. And that is a very, very true story. That's another spooky one. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly choked on my sweets then. <laughs> I'm sitting here eating sweets. <laughs> the kid. It's so brutal, <laughs> the, the whole drawn and quartering thing. Oh, uh, they do that. You know, we we used to love doing that. It was awful... Hang them first, and then whatever drawn and quartered. We yeah. we, we well, never we well, never well, got well, that over here in the states. Well, you know, well, you used to see well, yeah. <laughs> what I can say is, had the United Kingdom won the American War of Independence, all those people who had signed the Declaration would have been hung drawn and quartered, and quartered. Uh, that that was that was definitely on the cards mm, we're a gory lot <laughs> a violent <laughs> violent lot you know although you know with what's going on over here in our politics i wouldn't mind bringing that back <laughs> <laughs> you know what's old is new again <laughs> oh good lord well jail What's that? <laughs> Hillary for prison 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary for drawn and quartering. <laughs> Head on a pike. <laughs> That's what we should do. Anyway, um, uh, Simon, uh, th these stories are just absolutely brilliant. And uh, far be it from us to uh, interrupt you some more. So do you have another one for us? I, I do indeed. Um, as I said before, um, I am not a psychic, not a medium, not a clairvoyant. But I do find ghost stories fascinating. And um, some can be very, very touching. And uh, a couple of years ago, I came across a, a, a lovely uh, uh, lady who showed me a letter. But I'll tell you about the story, first of all, regarding the letter. We'll turn the clock back to the, wrong, the, the early time of the last century. And uh, a young boy called Jonathan Heskett. Uh, John was born at the wrong time of the last century. Um, he uh, went to the local primary school and uh, there he met a young girl called Annie Cresswell in the town of Lancaster in uh, Northern England. And uh, it's so unusual for two five-year-olds to have affection for each other, but they really did. And by the time they were 16, these two were absolutely inseparable. It became blatantly obvious they were deeply in love and they married each other at St. Michael's St. John's Church in the city of Lancaster and had a lovely honeymoon. They made their way to a gorgeous place called the Isle of Man, situated in the Irish Sea, not too far from uh, from Ireland. On coming back from their honeymoon, 
John was absolutely horrified to find a letter waiting for him from HM Government. He opened the letter. Oh no, it's me call up papers. I don't want to join the army. I've not even seen a German. I've gotten out against the Germans. I don't want to join the army. I don't, I don't want to kill anyone. He had no option. He was conscripted. He was sent to do his military training. And then he had seven long days leave in Lancaster with his beloved wife, young Annie. Every second, every minute, every hour of that leave meant so much to this young boy because he knew he wasn't going to see his 19th birthday. At the end of those seven days, he passionately, passionately hugged and kissed his young wife for the very last time as he climbed onto the engine, the steam locomotive, that took him out of Lancaster, down to the south of England. As he waved through the smoke, choked with tears, he blew a kiss to his wife for the last time. The only thing that helped him was that nearly every other man on that coach was going through exactly the same situation. The train arrived at the south coast of England and made its way across the English Channel. And there they made their way to a horrible place called the Somme Battlefield. They made their way up to the front line with the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Gurkhas. And as they got to the front line, um, they were told, right, gentlemen, this is going to be a piece of cake. We've been shelling the German lines for three days and three nights. There's no barbed wire left, huge gaps in the German lines, and um, we'll all be home by Christmas. The Sergeant Major then said, uh, right, lads, uh, just very, very quickly, could you all write a letter to your loved ones? John took his haversack off and quickly wrote a letter to his young wife in Lancaster. He then put the letter in an envelope and the Sergeant Major took each letter from each man and withdrew his bayonet and skewered all the letters and then placed the bayonet in a sandbag at the top of the trench. The whistles blew and down a 25 mile long trench these 90,000 British and Commonwealth troops made their way towards the German lines. They had no idea that the 1st of July 1916 was going to be the blackest day in the history of the British Armed Forces. By 12 o'clock that day, 29,000 young men had lost their lives. By the end of that day, another 35,000 had been wounded or captured without capturing a single inch of German territory. Even the Germans were quite shocked at this and word spread down the German line. These were lions led by donkeys. John was killed three minutes after leaving the trench. His young wife in Lancaster felt, oh, there's something wrong. I can feel it in my bones. There's something wrong, she said. For seven long days, that poor girl couldn't eat. She couldn't sleep. Uh, she couldn't drink. She just knew that there was something very, very serious that had taken place. On the seventh day, the postman arrived and put a letter through her letterbox, which hit the doormat. She rushed to the door and gazed down the letter and saw her name on it. She saw a strange tear in the corner of the letter and had no idea it's where the Sergeant Major's bayonet had pierced it. She opened the letter. The words were quite, quite beautiful, written by a boy of 18 who only had 15 minutes of life left in him. The words were, Dear Annie, you are the love of my life. I worship the very ground you walk on, my dear. If I cannot come back to you in the form of a human being, I swear to you, I will come back to you in the form of a ghost and say goodbye to you in the corner of Lancaster Castle, where we played as children. I was shown this letter by Annie's granddaughter and the only reason the story continued is that in those seven days leave, Annie conceived and that's the story continued. My words to Annie's granddaughter were, did your grandmother go to the castle that night? Oh, she did, she said, she did. At first, she couldn't see him, but she could smell him. And apparently as human beings, we all have a different odor, all of us. A bit like a DNA, really, I suppose. She could detect his aroma. He then appeared and she tried to grab him. Each time she tried to grab him, her hands went through him. 
He then turned with a glowing smile, passionately waved and blew a kiss to her, and then made his way to the next world. Poor Annie was 18 years old. She never really married, and she died in 1977, before she was finally reunited with the only boy that ever showed her any love, whose only crime in life was to be born at the wrong time of the last century. Oh. What happened to the child? Um, well, um, the, uh, Annie actually, um, you know, brought up the child by herself, and and she got married, and that's the granddaughter, the girl that showed me the letter. Uh, I felt very, very touched as I read this letter because it was written by a boy who only had 15 minutes of life left in him, and I felt very privileged uh, to look at such a treasured family heirloom. And um, a lot of those words in that letter had become quite badly smudged. And Annie's granddaughter mentioned that when her grandmother opened the letter, the tears spilled down her cheeks and actually distorted the ink. Uh, very, very touching. But of course, you know, all over um, Great Britain, and I'm sure the USA and Canada, uh, you will find war memorials with people's names that lost their lives at exactly the same age, of course. Shame, you're so young. Uh, terrible shame, terrible shame. and. Uh, but all over the country you see this, I'm afraid. All over the country. So, um, the reason I got interested in ghost stories was really because of my dad. And my dad wouldn't lie about anything. Um, way back in 1960, uh, my father bought a beautiful old Victorian house. It was built in 1898. It was in the English Lake District, a lovely place, very near Windermere, which is a beautiful Lake District National Park. The house was isolated. Um, it was beautifully isolated with, it, with its own grounds. And I remember arriving there at the age of six and getting out of the removal vehicle and looking up at this gorgeous stone built building, which had three stories. Beautiful building. Uh, my mum and dad uh, were very, very concerned about myself and my brother and sister because we were all under 10 years old and dad made at the beds right away for us and we all fell into a deep sleep after quite a long journey but my mum and dad of course continued to work downstairs unloading cutlery and other items and they eventually around midnight made their own bed because it was a country house the last job that needed to be done really would be the curtains and my dad climbed into bed after a long journey and quite a traumatic a traumatic experience just moving house if you will he turned over and there was bright bright moonlight illuminating the bedroom he then heard the sounds of tiny footsteps very very tiny footsteps and to his surprise and perhaps shock the bedroom door slowly creaked open and in came a liver and white cocker spaniel the dog made its way to the corner of the bedroom and my dad sat up in bed and gazed at it and the dog seemed to like turn its head as if as if its name was being called from outside my father uh, just thought well i must have left the door open downstairs i'll take the dog downstairs and shoot him outside he went to walk over to the dog come on come on let's have you and reach for its collar to his amazement his hand went straight through the creature he was shocked he made a second attempt and his hand went straight for the dog for the second time. The dog then turned as if its name had been called and vaporised. My mother had been in a very, very deep sleep at the time, a very deep sleep due to the long journey. And she woke up with a jolt to find my father sitting at the end of her bed. And she said, oh, I've just had this incredible dream. It was so clear. Uh, I dreamt there was a man outside the house in Victorian clothing with a dog lead looking up at our bedroom window. My father then told her what he'd just seen and they put two and two together. It's a story which has always fascinated me and as I said before my dad would never lie about anything and he told me that story many years later but it was a very very spooky house. Um, I'm told that um, when we left when the noon people bought the house, they too 
saw this ghostly dog, but just on the first night, it's almost as if the dog is the resident ghost there and welcomes every new family that move into this beautiful old Victorian house. That's lovely. Mm. Yes, isn't it? It's nice. Yeah, I like that one. It is a, it is a beautiful story, really. It really is, and... Uh, uh, I said it before. I, um, it's, it's something which has never ever left me. That one really, and I, I do use that um, when I, uh, I occasionally do talks. I, I, I'm invited to schools and sometimes uh, colleges, etc. And I always bring that story up because it, it is a very, very genuine, very, very genuine story. Yeah, yeah. It's, and children love to add, um, stories about animals as well. Let's face yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, th one thing that does amaze me, uh, Aaron, uh, when I get invited to schools, um, I'm always very, very diplomatic with um, s uh, hang, hang drawing and quartering, if you will. Yeah. But sometimes the teachers say, oh, no, uh, the more gory, the better. <clears throat> the kids love it for some reason. Oh, they do. <laughs> My grandchildren do. I, anything gory, they love. You know, but um, don't you try to tone down the hang, hang drawn and quartered bit a little bit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so have we got time for more, Mark? We certainly do. Um, we got about another 20 minutes left, so, you know, um, Simon? You get a sore throat, Simon. Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I've got a nice cup of tea here, really. Oh, and, that's uh, what I could do with. He's all prepared. It's nice uh, to actually have a roof on my head, because a lot of my tours, of course, take place outside. Um, what I can tell you is I live very, very near a famous hill called Pendle Hill. Oh, yes. And um, we just mentioned before the Jack the Ripper stories. If you were to get, shall I say, 10 stories from Great Britain um, that would fascinate people, I think the and Pendle the witches. witches would definitely come into that one, really. Yeah. Um, it's a very sad and a very, very tragic story. Uh, but we'll turn the clock back to 1603. And at that period of time, we had this marvellous queen called Queen Elizabeth I. And she led by example. Uh, she defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588, and many historians in Britain believe she was probably our finest ever monarch. A very, very and bloodiest. <laughs> and the bloodiest. bloodiest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When she died, she was replaced by a completely different character called King James the Sixth of Scotland, who then became King James the First of England. And this man was absolutely paranoid about witches. He not only believed that witches existed. He believed they were actually out to get him personally. He blamed the gunpowder plot on witchcraft. Uh, he blamed the fact his wife Anne of Denmark couldn't get from Denmark to Scotland on witchcraft. So when he became King of England, he wrote this book called the Demonology Book. And you can buy the Demonology Book today from any bookshop in the UK, USA. And as you pick it up, how to find a witch, how to try a witch, and most importantly, how to eradicate a witch. Throughout the whole length of Great Britain, this area known as the Pendle, Pendle Forest Hill seemed to attract an awful lot of attention. It was very isolated and uh, living uh, in the forest of Pendle with various people that just wished to live away from society. Of course, we all have to eat, we all need clothing and we all need a roof over our heads. And these people were no different to you and I. What made two of these so-called witches quite uh, unusual is that two of them, um, Bessie Chaddox and Demdike, were over 85 years old. Life expectancy in 1612, if you were lucky, would be 35. These two women were alive and kicking. Uh, when I say Chaddox and Demdike, their real name was Anne Whittle and Elizabeth Southern. Uh, Demdike lived in a stone cottage called Malkin Tower. Um, it sounds great, doesn't it, really? But it was a little cottage in the forest of Pendle, with probably just one big room. Living with her was her daughter, Elizabeth Device, and her three children, James, Jeanette, and Alison Device. Living nearby was Bessie Chattox, alias Anne Whittle, in the village of Newchurch in Pendle, with her daughter, Anne Redfern. Demdike and Chattox disliked each other intensely because they were both involved in the same trade, which in the summer months would entail making herbal remedies. In the winter months, uh, they would beg. It's said that Chattox broke into Malkin Tower one day and stole items of food and clothing. 
There was no love between these two people at all. But our story really starts way back on the 27th of March, 1612, when young Alison Device, granddaughter of Demdike, 14 years old, had a walk along the forest of Pendle. She came across a Halifax peddler called John Law. When I say peddler, John Law was basically a walking salesman. He had a large pack in his back full of 1612 luxuries, uh, like shirts, clothing, combs, mirrors, etc. And he'd go from village to the village selling his wares. He had the misfortune of meeting Alison Device. Alison would be dressed in rags and she begged of him. Oh, please, sir. Please, sir. Could you let me have a few pins, sir, to pin me clothing together? Please, sir. Get away with you. I'm not taking my pack off for you, lass. Get away with you. According to John Law, this huge black dog came from nowhere with snarling white teeth and glowing red eyes. And the dog sat right next to Alison and talked. Alison, shall I lay him for you? Lay him, lay him, she screamed. Law felt this terrible pain on his left arm, his left leg, and collapsed in absolute agony on the slopes of Pendle Hill. The kind people of the town of Cone in North Pendle, they could see him. They got a stretch team together and they carried him down to an old alehouse called the Greyhound, which is long, long since gone. There the landlord, John Evington, um, cleaned John Law. He spoon fed him. And as Law's voice returned, Law shouted, <coughs> I've been cursed. There's a witch in the hill, a young lass called Device. She's paralyzed my left arm, left leg. What's more, she's got a dog with her. And I swear to you, I've heard that dog talk. She's in league with the devil. I want you to send letters back to my family. Letters were sent back to Halifax and John Law's eldest son, Abraham, received the first letter. Hey, my father's in trouble. I better go and collect him. He set off from Halifax, arrived in Cone, and his father said, I've been cursed, Abraham. There's a young lass in the hill, a young lass called Device. She's got a dog with her. She's in league with the devil. I want you, lad, to find her. Bring her here. Well, Abraham must have been a very brave man. He set off on foot, walked for the forest of Pendle and found this little stone cottage. He hammered on the door. The door opened and there was James Device, Alison's youngest brother. I want to see Alison Device. Where is she? Uh, she's near, sir, said young, said young James. She's near, sir. Uh, she came to the door. Right, lass, you are coming with me. My father wants to see you. He dragged Alison Device from Malkin Tower, this little stone cottage down into the town of Cone and into the old Greyhound Inn where she made eye contact with John Law. John Law looked up from his sickbed. It's you! It's you! You're witch! You cursed me last, didn't you? This 14-year-old girl, on bended knees, burst into tears and admitted to witchcraft. She had no idea. She just admitted to a state capital offence of witchcraft. She begged forgiveness, and strange enough, John Law, the Halifax peddler, was about to forgive her, but not his son, Abraham. Oh, no, lass, we'll have you for this. I'm going to go and get magistrate. The local magistrate was called Roger Noel. He lived in the village of Reed, not too far from the town of Burnley. He was the local magistrate. Uh, he gave orders that Alison should be arrested. She was brought to Reed Hall, where she burst into tears and admitted to witchcraft. But she gave Noel a lot more information. My grandmother's a witch. So is Bessie Chattox and her daughter Anne Redfern. The four of us, we have these dogs. Tib, Ball, Fancy, Dandy. These dogs give us special powers. We get our powers off them. We also take hair and teeth from the corpses in the New Church Cemetery. And we make clay pits of human beings. We curse them. That's how we make our living. Well, Noel was actually delighted. He wasn't in any way frightened. And he immediately gave orders that Demdike, Chattox, Redfern should be arrested. They were brought to Reed Hall where they met young Alison. And this huge argument took place. They all tried to blame each other. But in doing so, they admitted to witchcraft, a state capital offence. They were sent to the city of Lancaster into the old Lancaster city uh, castle, deep into the well tower, where they were chained to the floor in appalling conditions. So deep was that uh, dungeon, that not even a chink of light could get down to them. In the meantime, on Good Friday, 1612, at the little stone cottage called Malkin Tower, the other so-called witches met. 
It was like a scene from a Shakespeare play as Alison's brother James slaughtered the sheep from the fell and they dined on mutton. They got a large cooking vessel called a cauldron and lit a fire beneath them. And the black super liquid inside began to bubble and steam. And into that black bubbling liquid went crushed, powdered, human teeth, the odd clay effigy, and indeed the odd human scalp. The whole idea was to get a potion together to blow the gates of Lancaster City Castle open and rescue their loved ones. But nothing happened. What did happen is word reached the ears of Roger Noel, the local magistrate, and he gave orders. I want everyone at this meeting to be arrested immediately. When word got out that they were going to be arrested, a few people thought, yeah, there's no way I'm hanging around, and they disappeared. In doing so, they saved their lives. The ones that were successfully arrested were as follows. Jeanette Preston of Gisborne, Kathleen Hewitt, Alice Gray of Cole, Alice Nutter of Rufflein, Elizabeth Device, James Device, Jeanette Device, and John and Jane Bullcock, a mother and son. They were all sent to Lancaster with the exception of Jeanette Preston. She came from the West Riding of Yorkshire, so therefore she was dealt with by the York City Magistrates and was found guilty of the murder of her employer, Mr Thomas Lister. She'd been nursing him, he had died, she wrapped his body in a clean white sheet ready for burial, and two days before the burial, she touched the sheeting and some fresh blood came through the sheet. This was classed as witchcraft. Her husband begged for her release, villagers begged for her release, but the judge said, I'm sorry. The king signed her death warrant before she even arrived here. She was dead before she even arrived here. And Jeanette Preston became the very, very first of the Pendle witches to be executed way back on the 27th of July, 1612. In the meantime, the others are being held at Lancaster, with the exception of young Jeanette Devise, Demdike's youngest granddaughter. She was kept at the home of Roger Noel, the local magistrate, and for the first time in her life she had nice clothes to wear, three meals a day, and a lovely warm bed to sleep in. After all this period of time, she's only too happy to incriminate her whole family. Now, what makes the story quite intriguing is that Demdike, Chattox, and Redfern, Elizabeth Device, James Device, and uh, Alison Device all admitted to witchcraft. However, three people didn't, John and Jane Bullcock and Alice Nutter. Now in those days, women in this country had no rights whatsoever. And it was believed by some men that women didn't even have a brain and were incapable of using a brain. And when it came to male chauvinism, this was a horrible period of time for women in this country. One of these so-called witches was a lady called Alice Nutter. She was very wealthy and extremely intelligent. She could read and write. She owned land on the side of Pendle Hill with her husband. She got very, very annoyed when um, other farmers were taking her land and pushing her fencing back and she was losing cattle and sheep and she got very annoyed. She said to her husband, look, I'm a woman, I can't complain, but you can. You need to go to Lancaster to get our land disputes sorted by the judges. I'm too scared. Well, I'll go, she said. She made the very brave decision to go by herself and she walked into a court session at Lancaster City Castle to the words of, there's a woman, it's a woman, get her out, it's a woman. There's a woman in the castle, get her out. Alice grabbed hold of furniture and the wardens tried to tug and pull her away from the furniture. She wouldn't let go of her grip. And they said, well, let her have her say. And in one afternoon, Alice Nutter, she uh, won all her land disputes, but she made a real enemy of Roger Noel, the magistrate. And he thought, this woman has really embarrassed me. Also, John and Jane Bullcock, these other farmers, they have embarrassed me as well by complaining about land disputes. I can kill two birds with one stone here. He had his trump card up his sleeve, young Jeanette. He picked Jeanette up wearing a lovely dress and put on top of a desk in the jury in the courtroom. And she shouted to the jury, me grandmother's a witch, me mother's a witch, me brother's a witch, so's my sister. And and Noel pointed at Alice Nutter and John and Jane, the three farmers. At this be here, were they at the Good Friday meeting at Malkin Tower? They were, sir. They were, sir. A look of horror came across the three of their faces, and Alice Nutter, to use a modern term, knew she was indeed being stitched up. 
she was found guilty of the murder of Henry Mitten of Ruffley, a village not too far from where she lived, because he wouldn't give her a penny. In court, she said, look, I don't need to beg. I'm a woman of wealth. And secondly, I don't know these people. I've never seen them before. But she knew she had indeed been set up by young Jeanette and indeed the magistrate, Roger Noel. The Pendle witches were all executed on the 20th of August, 1612, city of Lancaster, in front of huge, huge crowds. Watching that day was young Jeanette Device holding the hand of the local magistrate. She watched the whole family perish, and indeed John and Jane Bullcock and Alice Nutter as well. And as soon as they stopped twitching the pillory, Noel said goodbye. And she said, what do you mean goodbye? I'm not going back to that lovely warm room and those three meals a day and those nice clothes. Goodbye. He'd used her. And the poor girl made the long journey by herself back to a cold and empty cottage in the forest of Pendle. The following day, Roger Noel was sent down to London to meet the king, where he was knighted and made High Sheriff of Lancashire. The two circuit judges, James Orth and Edmund Bromley, were also knighted. And the clerk to the courts at Lancaster was a young boy by the name of Thomas Potts. He had no idea but he was going to make a lot of money out of a book which he produced next year in 1613 called The Wonderful Discovery of Witched in Lancashire, which earned him an absolute fortune. What we do find amazing about Pendle Hill is when the snows come to Pendle Hill, the last piece of snow to melt is always in the perfect shape of a white witch. And if you go to Google search and put the white witch of Pendle, you will see that actual last piece of snow melting in the perfect shape of a white witch. And there we have the Pendle Witch story. Oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a look at that. Fantastic. What, did, was there any, is there any other stories of them actually haunting? We've only got a few minutes left, but do you know whether there's any ghosts of them walking around? Well, um, I do take um, regular groups onto Pendle Hill. Mm. Uh, I will tell the story like I've just told you now. And they, um, they do bring mediums with them. Um, uh, one or two are exceptionally good, actually. One of them, a young lady called Caroline from the city of Nottingham. And what has happened on a few occasions, when I've done the story, Caroline then takes over. She'll do table tipping. Yeah. She does, in fact, use a Ouija board sometimes. But what has happened, uh, Aaron, amazes me. This gorgeous aroma comes from nowhere. It's mm. almost like a fabric conditioner smell. And the first thing I, I do is look around to make sure no one's got an aerosol, to make sure that no one's putting this on. But it only happens with Caroline. And you might say, well, does she use a, a perfume? Well, um, you can't smell it when you're talking to her, but the whole area, it's like walking into, into a flower shop. It's quite incredible, really. Yeah. yeah that could be a guide or something. Uh, yep, yeah, I mean, I don't know that. Well, does that but... only happen where, when you do it in that particular spot or in that it's particular happened, place? Yeah, in that particular spot, but it's happened even when it's been snowing, mm. uh, when the high winds in the middle of winter. But it has happened. And uh, it is a very spooky place to be. It really is. Oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. A lovely story. Well, a well, good story, actually, to finish off with, isn't it, Mark? It's a wonderful story. And, of course, we I'm going to have to, you know, segue that into a into a shameless plug for uh, one of our books with Glanatai Publishing, <laughs> yeah. The Demdike Legacy <laughs> by author um, uh, Barry Durham, uh, who's written a whole series of books on the Pendle Witches in modern day. Uh, and that's so this is one of those stories I could actually listen to you talk about and know a little bit about the background, uh, but you told it so brilliantly. So that's the Demdike Witches. Demdike Legacy. Barry Durham. Demdike. On the Glanantai website. Glanantai.com. <laughs> our, our publishing company. Yeah. That's our shameless <laughs> plug for the day. The, the Salem Witch Trials, the Salem Witch Trials, of course, that was indeed another British court in, in what would have been... Um, a very a similar court. story too, isn't it? Very, very, very similar, yeah. With a child. Um, yeah, Massachusetts, yeah. Salem. And uh, again, they used the child witness. Um, uh, and they did, in fact, base that trial on the Pendle Witch Trial, again, under British law. Uh, yeah. But uh, a lot of people did suffer terribly uh, due to the, uh, the greed of other people. And of course, male chauvinism was a terrible thing in those days. Yeah, still is today. <laughs> it is indeed. It is indeed. 
<laughs> and for and for those of us M- MCPs, male chauvinist pigs, you know, thank you, Victoria's <laughs> Secrets. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and and Baywatch. So, um, well, we have come to the end of the show, Simon. Thank you so much. These stories are wonderful. Uh, can you tell people how they can get in touch with you and uh, learn more about your tours? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I run my own tour tour company business. I'm the only employee, by the way. It's called www.tophattours.co.uk. You'll find uh, all the stories there on the website, but I also have a lot on YouTube as well. And uh, I started this series called um, Ghostly Tales from the Grave by Simon Entwistle. You'll find those on YouTube, and um, there are some pretty gripping stories there. Wonderful. Uh, you need to write yeah. a book, Simon. I have done, dear. I've got a book oh, called on, called Ghostly Tales of the Unexpected. And that can be found? The Unexpected. And you can get that on Amazon, um, in paperback, or indeed Kindle as well. Okay. And can people find you on Facebook and Twitter? They can indeed. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Lovely. Fantastic. All there right. you are, people. Well, There's no excuse not to get in touch with Simon Entwistle. There we go. Greatly appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank, uh, you. that's the end of our show. So I just want to thank oh, every... What's before, that? Before, we, be, before we go, Mark, where go ahead. can we be found? Well, we, as Paranormal UK Radio, the show is airing every Wednesday night on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, 9 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, We are also on the Dark Matter Digital Network on Monday nights from 10 to midnight Eastern Time. So uh, tune in and you can also get our podcasts on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and uh, we are also streaming live now on the TuneIn radio app as well as talk stream live and of course um the exciting news is that with the expansion of everything that myself and neil are soon going to be doing our own little chat show and uh, that's going to be called yes called the paranormal paranormal peep show uh, and that will be our uh, we're launching that in january yeah we haven't got a date january yet but we're launching so. yeah we're launching it in january 27 the paranormal peep show with andrew chaplin and neil geddes ward yes indeed um just a quick message for those in the southeast of england um for those who remember the ashley seberini um interview in halloween time he's actually doing a ghost hunt for high wickham paranormal and this will be on the 27th of december um and it's at the west wickham golden ball but you do need to book tickets in advance you can't just turn up and tickets are available at www.wickhamparanormal.com and i'm actually one of the guest mediums there so if you want to meet me in person then uh, get onto the website and uh, book a ticket thank you oh that sounds brilliant great Looking yeah, forward to yeah, it. I can't wait. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. <laughs> well, have a wonderful, happy Christmas, as you say Thank over you. there. A spooky uh, Christmas, a paranormal Christmas. Uh, a <laughs> uh, Christmas full of spirits. Yes, I'll, I'll, be, yeah. I'll have my glass <laughs> full of spirits the whole weekend. <laughs> One at a time. I said I'll have my glass full of spirits all weekend. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> okay, Simon, thank you very, very much for coming on thank the show you, and uh, telling us these brilliant, having... yeah, absolutely brilliant stories. All right, thank you everybody for listening and uh, have a have a wonderful Christmas and uh, we'll see you all in the new year. Yeah. Happy Christmas, everyone. Happy Christmas. <laughs>